You are listening to audio from Citizens Church Elmira. You can find more resources and learn more about our church at citizensalmira.ca. Let's turn to Habakkuk chapter 3 as we finish uh, this uh, brief series in this little Old Testament book. And as we do that, and as I'm going to extend the thought on Mother's Day just one more, just for another minute here, and I just want to acknowledge that there's, there's some in this room um, who aren't mothers yet and maybe wish that they were. Um, some for who uh, this journey towards motherhood has been a really tough one. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge that tension that we live in here. You know, as believers, we are called to rejoice with those who rejoice. And so we're going to celebrate our moms today, but we're also called to mourn with those who mourn. Um, and so if you find yourself in that place this morning, um, in that difficult position of seeking marriage and not having it, seeking a child and not having it. I just, I just want you to know that we are with you and we are for you because um, we know that today might intensify the pain you already feel. Um, I hope that when we all look at scripture, um, that we, and especially passages like this, um, like Habakkuk, um, that we are encouraged to know that when we find ourselves in places of tension and pain, that we can take that to the Lord that he is big enough to handle it, he is strong enough to hear our complaints, and he wants us to draw near. I hope that's the encouragement that you've heard as we've gone through um, this book of Habakkuk in the last few weeks. Um, And there's just three chapters in this short book, and uh, and as we've been going through it, you might have noticed um, that this this book of uh, Habakkuk is a little bit different than other books of Old Testament prophecy. Uh, See, when we typically approach a prophetic book, we kind of, um, we think of a prophet as being a messenger of God. And so we kind of assume um, that the message is maybe going to be one way, right? It's going to be a message from God through the prophet to a particular group of people. Um, It's just going to be a pronouncement of blessing or judgment. The prophet will simply deliver the message to the intended audience. But that's not exactly the case here. Um, In Habakkuk, what is preserved for us in the text is a conversation between the prophet and the father. Uh, In this case, we as readers and then the people of Judah as the original audience, we aren't really just recipients of a speech or an address. Um, We are spectators. We are onlookers to this exchange between Habakkuk and the Lord. And we've looked at this exchange between Habakkuk and God uh, in kind of three chunks, not only because there's three chapters, um, but because the whole rhythm of the book, even without the chapter divisions, kind of follows three chunks, right? The first two chapters have in them uh, two cycles uh, that follow the same kind of rhythm. There's a complaint by the prophet and then a response by the Lord, a complaint by Habakkuk and then a response by Yahweh. And then in the third chapter that we're going to look at today, it kind of pivots a little bit. So Habakkuk is upset by the evil in the first couple chapters that he sees around him. It seems like the Lord isn't doing anything. It seems that he's just going to let this all go on forever. Now, in his responses, God assures Habakkuk that he's not going to let it go on forever, but it's going to take Habakkuk a little bit uh, to kind of come to terms with God's reply in those chapters. And this, this cycle of complaint and response, complaint and response, maybe us not being super satisfied with the answer that we get, like, that's pretty relatable, isn't it? Like, it's very human what Habakkuk is going through. It's really real. I doubt that I'm the only one in the room that's had an experience like this where there's been this conversation back and forth with the Lord. And I mean, probably most of us are... Um, Our prayers and our prose aren't quite so eloquent eloquent as the Hebrew poetry that we've been reading in the past couple weeks, and maybe our wrestling matches with the Lord go back and forth for a few more rounds than just, you know, a couple chapters. Um, But nonetheless, we can relate to this questioning that we find in Habakkuk. And so we're kind of tracking with Habakkuk through the first two chapters. We kind of get where he's going there. Um, But this morning, I wanted to invite all of us to keep following him through into chapter 3. After this sort of frustrated exchange that he has with Yahweh, where does he land? That's what we're going to find out today. All right, so let's turn to chapter 3, and we see uh, right in the beginning of the chapter, uh, Habakkuk 3, verse 1, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shiginoth. Now, if you look at, so that's the superscription of the chapter we're looking at today, but if you look back at verse 1 in the book, 
you see that it was an oracle that the prophet saw. So Darcy and, and Chris kind of covered those first two chapters, that cycle of complaint and response. But now we can see right away in this chapter that the position has changed. Something is different. And it's, I mean, from a literary perspective, it's just like a style that has changed. We've gone from one style of writing and it's shifted a little bit. From like a deeper level, it's still a conversation with the Lord, but the tone of the prophet has shifted. Now, in, in verse 1 here, it's called a prayer. Um, but actually, you know, if you think about the Psalms of David even, or the rest of the Psalms in the book of Psalms, like, it's not uncommon for those songs that are written out to be referred to as prayers. And actually, this S word that I butchered at the end of the verse there, um, it's sort of untranslatable. Nobody knows for sure what it means. But it appears one other place in Scripture, in Psalm chapter 7. And it's probably like, a style of song, or it's a musical direction of some kind. And then if you just scan over the chapter, you're also going to see a word pop up in a few different places, the word selah, which is another word that shows up all the time throughout the book of Psalms. Again, not exactly sure what it means, but it's probably some sort of musical direction. So you see where I'm going with this. This prayer of Habakkuk is actually a song, it's actually maybe meant for him to sing to the Lord or to be used in corporate worship. We don't know for sure. And if you don't believe me at all about it being a song, you just have to look at the last line of the chapter that says, to the choir master with stringed instruments. Right? Pretty obvious. And see, the thing, the thing about songs is that, in general, they can be such a great window into the heart of the person that wrote them. There's something really powerful about lyrics when it comes to expressing what's going on in here. It's why we use music every Sunday morning in our worship together. Music and lyrics tend to help us express from our heart what simple words or even just a spoken prayer can't seem to do. And that's definitely the case here. This closing prayer of Habakkuk is helping us see where he has landed after all of this back and forth with the Lord. And the critical verses, the critical verses come at the end of the chapter, starting in verse 16. And they summarize the position of Habakkuk's heart. And they read like this. I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath, beneath me. So he's still in a position of fear or uncertainty. And then it says, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Habakkuk has decided to do exactly what God had asked him to do in chapter 2, verse 3. Wait for it. Habakkuk is choosing to wait for God's timing when it comes to dealing with the wickedness that he sees around him, both in the nation of Judah as well as the injustice that he sees in the Babylonians. And then he goes on in verse 17. He says, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the folds, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. This is like one of the most beautiful expressions of faith that we can find in Scripture. In spite of everything that Habakkuk is seeing around him, he has chosen to trust in the Lord. He does not know how everything is going to pan out. He doesn't seem to really love the response that the Lord has given him. And yet, he has chosen to trust Yahweh. He says, I'm going to wait and trust that God will come through. Now, I know that for me sometimes, and I'm sure for some of you, um, this might beg the question, well, why? Like, why do you trust the Lord, Habakkuk? When all the evidence around you suggests that God is not good, he is not sovereign, he is not trustworthy, why do you still express your faith like this? Because if in our own lives, this morning we're still in chapter 1 and 2, right? We're still in the middle of our complaint and we haven't made it to chapter 3 yet. Somebody admonishing us to just trust the Lord, to repeat the words of Habakkuk, like it can all feel pretty trite. It right? doesn't land quite well for us. Like, why should I trust God when he lets evil prevail? When we're still hearing about death in Eastern Europe. Why should I trust God when he let 
this virus destroy families? Like first and foremost by illness and death, but, but also just by our simple political differences. Why should I trust a God who demands obedience and yet the people around me who don't follow him, they seem prosperous, happy, fulfilled. When we're in those places, verses like Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, and Romans 8, 28, oh, God works everything out for the good of those who love him. Like, depending on how they're delivered and by whom, they can ring hollow. They don't sound like reasons to trust the Lord. They just sound like what people say when they don't know what else to tell you. And if we disconnected verses 16 through 19 from the rest of Habakkuk chapter 3, they might fall into that same category. No matter how eloquent this description of faith is, it perhaps could lack a certain weight, especially for some modern readers who value rationality, evidence-based thinking. We're skeptical of blind faith that simply believes despite all evidence to the contrary. But I don't think that Habakkuk's faith is blind in that sense. I think he has his reasons. And if we back up and we look at the rest of the chapter, we're going to get a clue into why it is. What is his reason for trusting the Lord? I think this is what we see. On the basis of God's faithfulness in the past, Habakkuk trusts God's character in the present despite his uncertainty about the future. Now there's a number of things in the text that would lead us to summarize Habakkuk's reason for trust in the Lord as God's history of faithfulness in the past. Some of these things are little nuggets that when we make a quick read of this passage or maybe when Sharice was reading, reading it through, we, we kind of miss them. They don't jump out to us because we're not steeped in Jewish history and culture and tradition the way that Habakkuk and his original readers or listeners would have been. You know, it's, it's understandable that we would miss some of these cultural and historical references just in general when we're reading the Bible. It can be tough to see, but it's especially true when we approach this style of literature because songs don't really take time to explain much, right? They just have very brief allusions and they assume the reader is going to put the pieces together. I mean, think about some of our worship songs that we sing on a Sunday morning, right? Like, baked into these songs is a pile of like imagery and context and language that we kind of take for granted because we're used to it. Um, But somebody coming in off the street totally new to it all, there's going to be some lyrics in there that are just sometimes, they're kind of weird. They're downright strange. Don't really know what's going on. When I think about that, I think about a couple years ago, I was was working up north uh, with a colleague of mine. We were were working up uh, on Highway 11 between... um, between Hearst and Long Lack, like up past Timmins and Cochrane. It's like a 12-hour drive to get there. Drove up with this colleague of mine. Um, when you spend that much time in a cargo van with a guy, you get to know a little bit about him, get to know a little bit about his music preferences. And, uh, and while I couldn't, hide, I couldn't hide for long that I kind of have a proclivity towards country and bluegrass. Right? And my colleague wasn't sure about this at first. He's like, ah, I don't know about that. But eventually I had him warming up to it. And at one point, he actually specifically requested what he uh, affectionately referred to as uh, my full twang playlist. And so uh, I was like, yep, absolutely, I'll put that on. So I put on my full twang playlist, and as the songs went by, I started to realize, oh boy, there's a few songs on here from Alan Jackson's Precious Memories album that have some fairly overt Christian themes. This guy has no Christian context, so I don't know how this is going to go. And so I said, well, all right, we'll just let it ride. And instead of skipping songs, I figured, oh, this might be a good conversation starter, so let's see what happens. So again, this guy doesn't have much of a faith background, so you can only imagine the look that he gives me when all of a sudden he hears Alan Jackson asking him, are you washed in the blood of the lamb? (laughs) See, to us, that imagery is, is commonplace. We know what it's all about. We sing along with not, without much thought. But to my colleague, it didn't seem quite so obvious to him. He had a few questions. And so that's what can happen when we read through Psalms. Um, so as we do that, let's, let's go through a few of these verses and try to see if we can pick up on some of those illusions that otherwise we would, we would miss. What is Habakkuk referring to? So if we go back to the beginning of the chapter, starting in verse 2. O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. 
So Habakkuk has heard of the great works of the Lord, possibly as a child growing up. You can picture him maybe in the temple, hearing as the history of Israel is recounted. He has heard of God's faithfulness, and he is asking God to act again as he has in the past. Verse 3, God came from Mount Taman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. Taman and Mount Paran are geographical references. They refer to the region that is south of Israel, kind of in the uh, area towards the Sinai Peninsula. So that's the area, the geographical area, where the Israelites would have wandered in the wilderness. So when he refers to these places, it might call to mind the period following Israel's exodus from Egypt. Okay, now these readers are thinking about Egypt and how God had delivered his people from the hand of Pharaoh. And then you could almost see in verse 4, when you think about that story and what we, what we do know about it, you could see in verse 4, when it says, His brightness was like the light, rays flashed from his hand, and there, there he veiled his power. Before him went, pe- went pestilence and plague followed at his heels. You could see his brightness was like the light. Maybe this is referring to um, when God's presence shows up in the burning bush. Or when the Lord appears to Moses on Mount Sinai. These are the things that are coming to mind. Before him went pestilence and plague followed at his heels. These are often used as pictures of God's judgment in the Old Testament. They're maybe going to call to mind the exodus from Egypt, right? The ten plagues in Exodus 7 through 10. And then into uh, verse 6. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Cushan and Midian, these would be Arab tribes that are in the region that have probably heard of the power of God and his defense of Israel. And they were afraid of knowing what Israel could do to them if the Lord was on their side. And that might call to mind the story of jo- in Joshua 2 where Rahab, the prostitute, is hiding the spies that are coming in to check out Jericho. And she says this to them. She says, All the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. So we see that Habakkuk's prayer here, it's really a prayer or a song of praise. He's referencing all of these little moments in Israel's histories. He's recounting God's display of power and his faithfulness throughout Israel's history to deliver that nation from their enemies. And this psalm of Habakkuk is heading towards this profession of faith at the end. It's building towards this confession of faith as he describes God's sovereignty and power and that faithfulness as the basis for trusting in him, even though in this present moment, things don't seem so great. He's saying, God, I know what you've done for Israel in the past. I've heard all about it. You rescued us from Egypt. You showed your presence to Moses. You gave us the promised land. And even our enemies knew how mighty you were. Verse 8 was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord. Lord, you turned the Nile to blood and you dried up the Jordan so we could walk across. Was your indignation against the sea, he goes on. You parted the Red Sea for us to pass through and escape Pharaoh. And then in verse 13, or sorry, verse 11, the sun and moon stood still in their place. At the light of your arrows as they sped, at the flash of your glittering spear, you marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. He caused the sun to stand still at Gibeon for Joshua so that Israel could be delivered from the Amorites. God, you have power over nature. You have power over nations. And you've consistently used it, used it to deliver us, your chosen people. Again, he's putting on display this power and sovereignty that God has, that he is ultimately in control. It's highlighting God's faithfulness to Israel in the past by alluding to specific instances where he's come through. And this prayer isn't like, oh God, you've done this in the past, why aren't you doing it now? No, this is like, God, you have come through in the past for us, and I know you will again, even though right now it really doesn't seem like you're going to. On the basis of God's faithfulness in the past, Habakkuk is trusting God's character in the present, despite 
his uncertainty about the future. And it's not just blind faith, choosing to believe that God is trustworthy even when it looks like he really isn't. He's saying that even though things are a mess around me, even though I don't know that I can trust you, there is a deeper truth that supersedes all of this experience. So I'm going to. And that's what leads him to say in verse 16, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. He has asked, how long, O Lord? God answered, not much longer. I'm going to use the Babylonians to judge the wickedness that you see within the nation. But then he says, ah, that's not the answer I was looking for in chapter two. How could you use even a worse nation to judge us? And God says, don't worry, we're going to deal with that in time. Habakkuk may not have originally liked God's responses, but he chooses to wait patiently for God to do his thing. Because he's gone on this journey uh, in this past few weeks, he's gone from passionate complaint to this poetic prayer and then to this affirmation of faith. And we see that it's not blind or baseless. He has intentionally grounded it in the history of Israel. That is his why. But what's yours and what's mine? I think that's the question we have to ask ourselves this morning is why do I choose to trust the Lord? What is my faith based upon? Because Peter writes in his first epistle, he writes, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. If Habakkuk was asked for his reason, we know what he would say. But we're not ancient Jews, so perhaps all of that history, all of that tradition of God's faithfulness to this people group, like that redemptive narrative there, maybe it doesn't really hold the weight for us that it would have for him. We're a bit further removed from it, and if we're really honest, it just, it just feels like Sunday school stories and, and myths. But I think this question is really important for us to consider, is why do we trust the Lord? Why am I betting my life on all of this? I think we owe it to ourselves and to others to be able to articulate that, because we're going to need this in the storms of life. We're going to need to remind ourselves why we are trusting God to be our anchor. And if we're going to go out there and ask other people to do the same, I think they deserve an answer when they ask, why should we trust him as our anchor rather than all of these other alternatives that we see? See, those who know, those who know a bit about my story will know that um, during my time at university, I went through a period of questioning just about everything um, that, that you could when it comes to uh, the Christian faith. This was mostly an internal struggle for me. Um, I don't think my experience was terribly unique, um, and others, others have similar stories, but I recall feeling overwhelmed and bombarded at that time with all sorts of questions, and I was wondering, man, like, can I really trust God? Now, obviously, I've come through to the other side, and I do trust him. Wouldn't be standing here if I didn't. Through that journey of faith, uh, doubt to faith, I found a lot of things compelling, right, for reasons uh, to trust the Lord and to trust that he is good. But at some point, for me, it ended up boiling, boiling down to just really a, a single couple questions. Who was Jesus? And more specifically, are the Gospels accurate representations of his life and identity? Because if they are, if this man was God, and he was who he said he was, if he really rose from the dead, that has a lot of implications. A lot of things flow from that. And again, obviously at this point, I'm convinced that yes, in fact, what we see described in Scripture about Jesus is true. But the implications for me are not just intellectual. If the gospel is true, that tells me a ton about God's character. That the Almighty would become man that he would suffer and die on my behalf and that he would use his infinite power to rise and give me new life because he loves me. That that's not just a nice story, but that's a fact of history. That means a lot. And he promises that whatever I'm experiencing in life at this moment, no matter how difficult, this is all only temporary because he's going to come again because he loves me. And I can, I can take that to the bank. If I had to boil it down to one sentence, I can take that to the bank. Why do I trust God even in the moments when he seems untrustworthy? It's because I believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead. And of course, we could expand on that, but that's another, 
like sermon three, five, ten at least, right? So we're not going to do that this morning. And I'm sure some of us uh, here, if you were pressed and somebody asked you, what is your why? Like, why do you trust the Lord? You could give an answer to that, right? You could summarize it in a few sentences or paragraphs, boil it down to just like one nugget because you've had to for somebody or you've thought about this before. You know, you've got your reasons. Maybe it's a particular intellectual argument. Perhaps you have your own history of faithfulness that you've seen God demonstrate in your life. And just, just like Habakkuk has, has seen Israel's history, you have your own things that you look back to. But I know for sure that there's, there's others here with us that are wrestling, right? You don't, you don't know if you trust God, let alone why. Some of us haven't made it to chapter 3 yet. We're still back with Habakkuk in chapters 1 and 2. Or we're maybe in a cycle of that, you know, in a season of that. We're in this cycle of complaint and response. Maybe it's over a particular situation in your life or in the world around us. You don't know where it's going to land. You're not actually convinced that God is going to come through. Or maybe you've already seen how it, how it has landed and you don't really like it. You don't think it's good and you, you're, not, you're not sure how this possibly God could use. Maybe it's hard to put a finger on exactly what the complaint is. Maybe we're just questioning everything. Like, what does it mean to believe? Why should I trust the Bible's description of reality or the institutional church's approach to following Christ? Why do you think you have it right, citizens? (laughs) I don't know. I don't know what each of us are wrestling through. But I know, I know that we all wrestle I know that many of us come from different faith backgrounds. We grew up in churches around here, and something has shaken us a little bit. We've come to citizens because something wasn't quite sitting right in the other places where we were worshiping, but we're not ready to give up on the whole faith thing wholesale. And if that's you this morning, I am so glad you're here. Some of us are in the middle of really challenging seasons. We had a plan of how life was going to progress, And apparently the Lord did not get the memo. Those are tough. And if that's you, I am so glad you're here. And some of us, I mean, man, things are going pretty well. Right? Like you're, you know that there's tough times behind you. You know that there's probably tough times ahead. But like right now, it's kind of easy to celebrate. Things are coming together. And that's amazing. And if that's you, I am so glad you're here. My hope and prayer, though, is that together, all of us can make this place, this church, a place that no matter what spot we find ourselves in in life, no matter what season we are in, that we can all gather and we can have grace for one another as we sort all of that out. We can be honest with each other. I pray it's a place that we can deconstruct and rebuild our faith as many times as as we need to, so that we can say with confidence, though the fig tree should not blossom, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. So no matter where you find yourself, I encourage you to spend some time this morning. Think, think about your why. Why do I trust the Lord? And if you're not sure that you do trust him right now, press into that. You are welcome here. I only ask that you're honest with yourself you're honest with others, and you're honest with the Lord. Don't be afraid to take your questions and complaints to him, like Habakkuk did. Because if he's not worth trusting, you should want to find that out. But if he is, and I believe he is, if God is truly who he says he is, then he is big enough to handle it. No question is too tough. And it is totally worth leaning into him. Because your relationship will go further and your trust will run deeper. So that when the waters rise, when the storm rages and war breaks out, though everything is chaos around you and it seems like the earth is collapsing beneath you, you will know that it isn't. You will be able to say with Habakkuk, God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. You will know that God is still good, that he still reigns, that he is still near. Over the last few weeks as we've been studying Habakkuk, um, and particularly as I read this closing to Habakkuk chapter 3 a few times, um, you know, specifically verses 16 through 19, 
Um, there's a moment in my recent time uh, in Ukraine that just like kept coming to mind. Um, I couldn't get it out of my head. Um, the last Sunday that I was there, a few of us had a chance to visit a local church um, where that had been housing uh, a lot of displaced Ukrainians. They had been providing food. Um, and there was a number of our staff translators at the hospital that we were working at um, that were attending at this church. And so we had the chance to go, go visit. Um, it was in an afternoon, uh, and I think it, it makes sense, probably makes sense to everybody, that that service that we were at was quite powerful. Right? Every lyric we sang, every scripture we read, every word we heard from the pastor seemed to be especially poignant given the context that we found ourselves in. And at one point during the service, um, we, we sang uh, the Casting Crown song, Praise You in the Storm. And as we did that, my, uh, my eyes just like filled up with tears and I just had to stop because at that moment, I didn't think those, these were not my words to sing in that context. And I looked around and I saw all these believers that were like expressing their faith in the Lord through this song. And I don't know what each of their whys were. I don't know what their stories were that gave them the reason to trust, um, trust the Lord. But despite having what seemed to me like really good reason to, uh, to lodge a few complaints with the Lord, you know, given what was going on in their country, um, these Ukrainian believers with a contemporary song were echoing the prayer of Habakkuk that we have looked at this morning. And so as we close, I just want to invite you to stand with me. Um, the band is going to come up. And I'm just going to read uh, the lyrics of this song. And as I do, I want, I want you to ask yourself, do I trust the Lord enough to make this my expression of faith? I was sure by now, God, that you would have reached down and wiped our tears away, stepped in and saved the day. And once again, I say amen, and it's still raining. But as the thunder rolls, I barely hear your whisper through the rain. I'm with you. And as your mercy falls, I'll raise my hands and praise the God who gives and takes away. And I will praise you in this storm. And I will lift my hands for you are who you are, no matter where I am. And every tear I've cried, you hold in your hands. You've never left my side. And though my heart is torn, I will praise you in this storm. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are good, that you are almighty and that you are faithful and that no matter the place that we find ourselves in, your character has not changed and our future is secure with you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.